Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. This is Pasadena Humane. I'm Sarah Muriello, and with us today is our behavior and training manager, Fernando Diaz. Hey, Fernando. Hello. Hi. So today, Fernando is going to present on the topic of why does my pet do that, understanding and managing problematic behaviors. Um, we're going to cover dog and cat behavior in this webinar, and I think we did get a couple uh, unique questions on tortoises and some critters that Fernando will do his best to address. Um, but before we launch into the presentation, I just wanted to share with you a few webinar reminders. So during this webinar, you should be able to hear us, but we can't hear you. You're automatically muted by GoToWebinar. Um, and you should be able to see us and or our screens, but we won't be able to see you. We're gonna ask that you save your questions for the end. And the reason for that is that um, we hope that most of the questions are answered during Fernando's presentation. But in addition, we're saving time at the end for a Q&A. The way that you would submit questions, and I've seen a few coming through, so I know some of you know how to submit questions, but it's by using that chat box under the questions tab. Um, we ask that you don't raise your hand. Um, that is an audio feature. Um, and since we're not using that audio feature today, we would not be able to hear you if you raised your hand. So please go ahead and submit any questions through that uh, chat box. Um, so the chat box questions that you submit will only be seen by me, um, and as time permits, I'll go ahead and get those questions um, over to Fernando during that Q&A session. We do also want to let you know that this webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch this webinar anytime. You'll receive an email tomorrow afternoon with a link to this webinar recording. And also anyone who was unable to attend the live broadcast but registered for this webinar will receive the same link. We also wanna remind you of um, one upcoming free webinar we have for June um, before our July program starts. So next Wednesday, June 17th from 12 to one, we have Sandra Grossman from Pet Loss Partners presenting on preparing to say goodbye anticipating pet loss. And that's a really important webinar for any pet owner, no matter how old your pet is. Um, it's really helpful information um, to start that process of uh, knowing what to expect. And you can register for that webinar and any of our free webinars at pasadenahumane.org slash workshops. All right. So at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Fernando. Uh, just give me one moment to switch screens. Well, hello everyone. Um, as Sarah said, my name is Fernando and I'm the Behavior and Training Manager at Pasadena Humane. Um, but more than that, I'm passionate about enhancing the human and animal bond that we have with our, our pets. Um, it's, it's sad for me when that that's lost and when we need to uh, work to get that back together again. So that's really what this webinar today is about, is working to maintain and build that bond. So before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping, um, and you'll hear me repeat some of this throughout the webinar, but always, 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 we wanna rule out medical concerns. If we are working to modify behavior, but have not ruled out medical concerns, we may find that that behavior continues despite our efforts. So medical concerns trump behavior every day. What I've done today is put together some common issues that I hear about along with some common solutions. This is not gonna be exhaustive, and this may not fit everyone's needs, but hopefully this will help the majority of you. Um, and for those who it doesn't provide a solution for, we have our behavior helpline and we're always happy to help out with that as well. Um, there are no magic wands or silver bullets. Now, each behavior problem, depending on how long it's been going on, will 
dictate how difficult it is to uh, fix it or to modify that behavior. Some will be a lot easier than others. So learning, learning ha is happening all the time, regardless of whether we're actively trying to teach our animals. Um, and I'm gonna go through the first couple of slides a little bit quickly, because um, I know you guys want to know about how to modify these behaviors, really. But it's important to remember that if we've taught our animals to do something, that's why they're doing it. And it may not be something you deliberately did. You know, the, the way you interact with an animal coming into the house can affect its behavior. And we all do this. I'm guilty of this. I've accidentally taught many bad behaviors that I've had to go back and fix later on. So reinforcers, what are reinforcers? Technically speaking, a reinforcer is anything that makes a behavior happen more. And so that could be food, which is what we normally think of. Um, it could be something going away. It could be um, getting a toy or getting attention. We never know what's gonna be the reinforcer until we look at the animal's response. Equally important is to remember that behaviors occur to create a function, it, to create a, a, a consequence. And so be, these animals are doing things that they feel a need, they feel a desire. And so it's not other, there are not other reasons for that. It's very simple. It's this behavior fills a need or a desire. Um, and so then when we're looking at that, the question comes around to, well, how do we find out what is that need desire? What, what is going on here? Um, you know, I often hear people say, well, how do I correct this behavior? Correcting the behavior does not take away the need or desire. And really, even if it stops the behavior, they're still gonna continue finding another way to fill that need and desire. Needs and desires typically fall into these four categories. Sensory, something that brings pleasure. Escape, removes them from an uh, unwanted situation or has something go away from them that they don't want. Attention, we all like a little attention. And then something tangible. That could be something physical, that could be an activity. Um, but all these behaviors fill these functions. Equally important is to think about what a behavior is not. Um, you know, we tend to attribute a lot of human emotions to the behaviors that we see. And the truth is, it's much simpler than that. You know, we go back to those functions. It's filling those needs and desires. You know, your dog is not trying to get payback. I do have a couple things here that I want to chat about briefly, one of which is dominance. We have this culture and, and uh, popular TV kind of pushes this idea that dogs are behaving a particular way because they're trying to dominate us. The idea of dominance came, that came around, uh, I believe, in the 70s when Dr. David Meech was studying wolves. And he saw this hierarchy where certain wolves would get to eat first and other wolves had to sit and wait. And so he wrote about it and said, it's dominance. There's a more dominant animal there. We took that and said, well, dogs are wolves. Tell that to your chihuahua. Um, but really, we just cut, brought that over to dogs. What we don't know is the other half of that story, or what few of us know. David Meech then came back and with later versions of his book, he retracted that statement. He said that there was no dominance. There was a family structure. There was mom and dad and the, the pups and, and uncle and aunt and so forth. And just like in a home, we expect certain behaviors from our children that we may not expect from an adult, wolves had the same thing. And that's something that dogs do have in common. Um, they do have a family structure. Uh, a mother will teach her pups certain things if she's well socialized. And so that's really what we're looking at. The problem is that when we attribute dominance to be a character trait, a, a personality trait, we remove our ability to really change it. It's a lot easier to change a behavior than it is a personality. Think about someone trying to tell you to change your personality, who you are. That's really difficult. And we put, ourselves, we put a wall in front of ourselves when we call a dog dominant. The other thing I wanted to talk about briefly was guilt. I often get people tell me that my dog knows he did something wrong because he looks guilty. Now, what they're really doing is reading our body postures. So if you have a dog that has a tendency to house soil and you come home and you're expecting there to be a mess, then your body postures are gonna be a little bit more tense, a little more stern. Even if they did house soil an hour ago, 
they have no connection to that anymore. It's past. Five minutes is too much time for them to really understand why they're in trouble. And so they're reading our behavior. I, I know I've been guilty of coming home and seeing my dog look guilty about something. Maybe I had a rough day and I'm looking around going, what did you do? And I have to remind myself, it's me, it's not them. And the important thing about that is this affects how we interact with our dogs and our ability to modify those behaviors. So I'm not calling anyone out saying you did something wrong. However, I wanna make sure that we are on the right track as far as modifying behavior successfully. So on to the meat and potatoes as it were. Dogs barking, you know, we, that's a very common behavior. We have dogs that bark because they were reinforced. We thought it was cute when they were itty bitty, I don't know, 10 pound puppy and now they're 40 pounds and it's not quite as fun. Um, it could be something like, we, we like having a, the feeling of having a guard dog protecting us, but we don't necessarily want them fighting us to get to the door or scaring off our significant other. It could be fear or anxiety. But the point is, regardless of where it comes from, it works. It's why they keep doing it, or at least in their perspective. If the dog barks because the mailman comes to the door and then the mailman goes away, well, that dog just scared the mailman off. Yeah, he's courageous, isn't he? So we know why they do it. The question is, how do we fix it? And this is where I look at two different options. We can manage it or modify it. Typically, management is easier and requires significantly less work and time. It can be something as simple as removing them from the situation. If you know someone's coming, put your dog outside for a little while or in another room. My dogs tend to bay when someone comes to the door. So I send them to their crate and I give them a nice yummy calm with that. They're silent the whole time. In fact, I had people delivering furniture yesterday and I think I had like three barks the whole time because they were busy eating their calms. So you can manage it that way. Um, you can also block access. So if, it, if the issue is I'm trying to get to the door and I'm fighting my dog, to, you know, get past my dog to open the door, maybe you can put up a baby gate or some other block it, way to block the doorway so that they can't get access. That gives you a little bit of space to, to, to move. As far as modification goes, we have, another, we have a couple different options. Um, some of the simpler ones are we can do what's called a relaxation protocol. And so if you guys Google Karen overall relaxation protocol, it's Karen overall, um, you can actually see a very rather complex and long, but well set up relaxation protocol. And the idea behind that is you're teaching your dog to settle, to relax. The basic thing, you take a mat, a rug, a towel, something that looks different from the regular floor and gets put away when not being worked, and you lay it out. And you train your dog, you give them treats for approaching it for laying down on it, for relaxing on it, and you're reinforcing that behavior. And then when someone comes to the door, you lay the mat out and direct your dog to go lay down. This takes time and again, consistency, but it can teach your dog to actually relax when someone comes to the door. The positive side to that is you can also take that on the road with you. And in other stressful situations, your dog sees that as a sign to condition him to relax. Another option is what we call constructional aggression treatment or cat training. That needs, that, that requires a partner. Your partner comes to the door and you guys are in communication, maybe it's through cell phones. And as your dog is barking, maybe he stops for a second. Maybe he looks back at you. Maybe he just takes a breath. You reinforce that, give him a treat, and that person leaves. You let your dog relax a little bit and then repeat. And you're actually conditioning your dog to relax instead of barking is what causes the person to leave. So these both take time, they take effort, uh, they're not easy, but they can work to solve that problem. Typically, I do recommend management. It's a little easier. So cats. Cat house soiling is one of the number one reason why cats are relinquished to shelters. So it's a big deal. The first thing I look at is, is that cat spayed or neutered? If not, they might be soiling because of that. Is it a urinary tract infection or are they fluted? Um, and I can't remember the exact acronym what fluted stands for, but it's basically a medical condition where they may have stones or another, an infection in their uterus, um, I mean, a urinary tract infection, excuse me, and that causes them pain when they urinate. It's very uncomfortable and they can actually die from that. So getting that treated is a huge thing. 
It could also be communication. Unfortunately, the number one way that cats want to communicate when they're stressed, when they're uncomfortable with something, is by urinating, typically on something personal. So if you come home and your cat urinates on your jacket, purse, pillow, it's a high possibility that they're trying to tell you something. And as obnoxious as that is for humans, it's a very clear way for them to communicate. So what do we do? First and foremost, let's talk to the vet. If they're not spayed or neutered, let's get that on the calendar. If they've got a UTI or they're fluted, usually that can be treated without getting any kind of um, surgery procedures, medical, um, there are medications you can use, and sometimes special foods. Talk to your vet, they'll have more specific information on how exactly to treat that, if that's the case, um, and they can test for that. If it's a communication issue, let's look at stressors. Now the fun thing about cats is, they may have been stressed by something 30 days ago. Maybe you had a house party and your, your shy cat just lost it. That's enough to cause them to house soil that far, that far along the uh, timeline. So once we identify the stresses, we can look to manage that and change that. You know, next time you have a house party, maybe you put your cat in a separate room, some treats and a toy. Let them have their space, preferably as far away from the noise as possible. We can also look at managing stressors in, in the opposite direction by providing stress relief. Um, giving them space is huge for cats. Um, and I'm not looking at creating an addition to the house or anything silly like that, but put up a couple shelves for them. Give them access to a high point. Vertical space is as important, if not more important, than horizontal space. And play therapy. Play therapy is basically a ritualized version of play for cats. Cats have not changed much at all since they became quote unquote domesticated. Um, they're still hunters. And so basically what you're doing is taking a wand type toy with string and feathers and you're playing with them at around the same time every day. This toy needs to be unique in that they only comes out for that play session. And it's okay if they've got two or three of them that they have access to all the time. This one just gets put away. You play with them and treat it as if it was a real animal. Let them hunt it. Let bring out the inner tiger in them. And when they're done, well, like any successful hunt, you get to eat your prey. So we wanna give them some meat, deli meat or, or tuna, a little bit of turkey, nothing too spicy, save the cage and turkey for later. But this gives them a sensation that they've gone hunting, they've stretched their bodies out, they've expended energy, and they were successful and confident. Before we move on to the next slide, I do wanna to touch on cleaning. I hear a lot of different versions of how you clean up for accidents. Um, for anywhere from soap and water to vinegar to some of these enzymatic cleaners, there's only one way I know of that you can be sure that you've destroyed all proteins so that there's no odor cues, which would lead a, a cat or a dog to go back and urinate again. You wanna get an oxidizing cleaner. Oxidizing cleaners use a special chemical process to break down that urine and they don't fail when, you, when following the, the instructions on the package. Enzymatic cleaners usually are successful, but sometimes they fail depending on the circumstances. And once they fail, they're guaranteed to continue to fail in that particular application. So oxidizing cleaners. So doghouse soiling. It's very similar. We want to rule out any kind of medical issues so that urinary tract infection, dogs can get that too. And it is quite painful. Uh, we consider odor cues. If your dog is urinating in the same place day in and day out, it's quite likely that there's an odor cue there. House training. I often hear people tell me, my dog is house trained. He only has accidents once a week or every other day. That's not house trained, unfortunately. Um, it may be that you have a doggy door, so they just have access to the outside, so that calms the situation. And maybe they, maybe you work from home, and so you're able to take them out all the time. So you're able to beat them to the point where they have to go. True house training means that they know where to, to go outside and not to go inside. And ideally are able to signal in some way, hey, mom, dad, I gotta go. You know, my dog will stand by the door to the yard, kind of look back at me. Now lets me know, okay, I gotta get up and let you out. My other dog just comes over and sits in front of me and stares. Again, I know I gotta let him out or take him for a walk. The other reason for house, tra uh, for house soiling is appeasement or excited urination. Um, they're similar in that they have the same 
basic reasoning behind them, a lack of self-control. So with appeasement and excited urination, it's very important to note, to note that they are not aware that they're doing it. And usually it's little squirts. It's not a full emptying of the bladder. So if we punish them for appeasement or, ex or excited urination, they don't know why they're being punished, even if they're in the middle of urinating. So what do we do? Vets, 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 vets. Let's clear out any medical conditions first. We wanna make sure that these animals are in tip top condition. There's no, you know, if you're an older dog, they may get incontinent and, or it can be a, a urinary tract infection. So we wanna check that, make sure. We wanna clean, use those oxidizing cleaners. If this is a house training issue, we need to look at rehouse training or maybe initial house training. Um, and I say rehouse training because if you just move into a new house and your dog suddenly starts to urinate everywhere, it's possible that it's a vet issue, but it's also possible the previous owner had a dog that had accidents. And so they're just smelling odor cues. And an odor cue is like a big sign saying toilet here. So we want to clean, we can rehouse train, and house training is just consistency and routine. So it, it's not, I take my dog out 12 times a day. It's, I'm gonna take my dog out twice a day, three times a day, understanding there's gonna be some accidents and I'm gonna clean them, but they're gonna learn the routine. And when they go outside, well, that's just the best dog in the whole wide world. You heap that praise on them. If they'll take treats, you give it to them, but you let them know, you're amazing. You just went outside, very important. And as far as appeasement and ex, uh, excited urination, we want to build confidence. Good training program is going to help with that. Um, starting in July, we'll be having our training program starting back up at the shelter, and you can bring your dog in here to actually get some good positive reinforcement training. So cat aggression, cat on cat aggression. Um, a lot of different reasons why this might occur. Territory, and territory is not necessarily the space in and of itself. It's the resources that are implied by the space. Now, you might live in a loft or a mansion, but your cat dictates whether or not they have enough resources. You really have very little say in that. If you're feeling that your cat is struggling with resources, adding those shelves and, and giving them more uh, vertical space can help with that. But at the end of the day, they decide what they're comfortable with. It could be lack of or poor socialization. So if they were a singleton kitten, and went into a home and never engaged with other cats, and now they're 12, and you bring home that new kitten, they might struggle. It could be the past. If they've had bad interactions and haven't really had good interactions, or even the most recent interactions were bad, that can overshadow those previous good ones and teach them that having another cat in their space is a problem. So what do you do? Again, very similar to the cat house dwelling issue, it's built on stress. We look at space. Can we give them space? And a key thing to think about when you're looking at space for multiple cats is cats have preferred areas. And so if you've got this beautiful sun spot and you have this nice little shelf system for them to climb up to get there, but they have to go past the other cat to get up there, you've got a problem. They need to have a route that they can use to avoid that other cat. Another issue. Um, Stress relief, that play therapy or clicker training, fantastic idea. Um, I often get people pause when I say clicker training a cat. You can't train a cat, but you can. Um, my cat, she's no longer with me, but she knew to target, to sit pretty, to come when called. She even knew to get off of things that I didn't want her to be on. So I didn't have cat litter all over my kitchen table. And that was pretty easily done using clicker training. Positive associations. Creating positive associations could be something as simple as when the cats are together, they get treats. And if you haven't already done so, we need to do an introduction process. Slow that introduction process down. How long does that take? I often am asked. As long as it needs to. It depends on the cats. But the basic idea is initially they can't see each other. They can smell each other. You can share blankets that they've rubbed on and bedding um, and feet on opposite sides of a door. And if they're doing well and there's no hissing, we can graduate to seeing but not touching. Um, if you have a glass door, that's ideal. If not, uh, baby gates or uh, cracking the door. If you're cracking the door, make sure they can't get their head through because if their head fits through, they probably can fit the rest of themselves through. Um, 
And then you graduate to the point where you're actually doing a physical introduction, where you're there to manage and control. And if at any point you start seeing escalation, you might just take a step back to that last successful step. Um, it just may mean that you move too quickly for their taste. Um, and I, I talked about if you see hissing, hissing, even a little hissing is not a good sign. Um, it's kind of like being around someone who yells at you all the time. It's almost worse when it's once in a while because you're on pins and needles. You never know when they're going to yell again and just startle you. So it's really important to look at that. I often get people who get cats for other cats. Now, there are exceptions, but generally your cat doesn't want another cat. Um, you're, you may want another cat, and that's perfectly legitimate. But if you're looking at getting a cat, whether it be for your other, for your cat or for yourself, make sure you get that cat's seal of approval. That's space. Make sure you have enough space so your cat feels secure. Energy. Make sure they're comparable energy levels. If you have a 14-year-old cat that loafs around, they're going to struggle with a kitten. It doesn't mean you can't be successful, but it means you need to take other steps. Age. Age is not always related to energy, but often is. And then learning experience. What is their past like, if you do know this? This is probably the hardest one for us to be able to cover um, as we adopt or, or get new cats. But if we can know about their socialization and we know that they have good socialization, that's gonna help us out. Dog aggression. Now this one's a hard one. Um, and I'm, not, I'm afraid I'm not gonna be able to give a whole lot of information on this because dog fights can be ugly and people can get badly hurt um, if, if they're not handled correctly. So, I'll go into the why and then I'll give you some steps, but mostly management. So resources, D dogs don't necessarily get jealous, but they do have a sense of having their resources and having sufficient resources and, and a feeling of losing of resources. So that's important. Poor socialization, dogs have their first four or five months of life to play with other puppies. And if that doesn't happen, like in this such pandemic we're in, which is very difficult to do that safely, um, they may struggle as adults. They may have a limited vocabulary from a dog perspective and not understand what other dogs are saying to them. Um, it becomes very difficult for them to be around other dogs or they are, there are specific dogs that they're able to engage with safely. The past, if they were attacked by other dogs, um, that can affect how they respond to new dogs. Sometimes to the point where a specific type of dog or a shape of dog incurs a escalation on their part. And then arousal control. And that's one we can really work with. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that briefly. So what do we do? Professional help. If you have dog aggression issues, I highly recommend you get professional help. Now this may be as simple as calling our behavior helpline and having a chat with us so we can get more information and get specifics on what you're seeing and what you're experiencing. Uh, we also offer virtual consults. And that might give you an opportunity to film your dog interactions and let us see that so that we can really help you. Or maybe so, to the point where you need to hire someone to come into your home. And that's a little more significant and a little harder during these times, but um, we are definitely here to help with that. Management is important. We don't want to rehearse the behavior, so keeping them separate as much as possible, especially if you're not there to physically watch over them. That's very important. Um, and look at your introduction process. You want, to, you want to be on neutral territory without anything that they can get jealous over or feel that they need to fight over. Um, balls, toys, food, those are all possible uh, triggers. Go on parallel walks. You and a partner take your dogs for a walk, and if they're behaving well and showing relaxed, positive signs, you come closer. If they are continuing to get worked up, whether it be you know, bearing teeth and other forms of aggression, growling, or just high excitement or high arousal, go further apart. But use your time to really introduce them properly so that they have a they can get to know the other dog at their own pace. This may mean putting up a series of baby gates so that they can't physically interact as much until we get help or until they get used to each other. So I mentioned arousal, and that comes down to impulse control. Now there's a, a training method that is uh, pretty controversial with different trainers. Some love it, some don't. Um, I'm a fan of it, and it's called Nothing in Life is Free. And the basic idea behind that is if your dog wants something, they do something. So my dogs, at feeding times, they sit and they station at a particular spot, 
I put their food down and then I release them so they can eat. Um, when I'm filling their water dish, they sit. Now this helps me. I don't have a dog knocking over the pitcher of water while I'm trying to fill their dish, but it also gives them a sense of they know how to ask for what they need. If I miss filling their water dish, my boy comes over and sits next to the water dish and looks at me. That's a clear signal to me that, oh, they, their dish is empty. My bad. Um, but it gives them a way to trade. And I compare this to the child that is told, you know, they say, I want ice cream. And so you give them ice cream. They don't know how to handle when, it's, when they're told no. And whether you're telling them no or the world is telling them no, at one point it's going to happen. It's hard to manage that. And the same is true for our dogs. So that impulse control can be very powerful. It doesn't mean that we can't just go love on our dogs when we want to. It just means that when they want something from us, they trade. Okay, so this is one of my favorite topics. Um, and I have that asterisk next to random biting because very rarely is it truly random. Now, it may be that you played the hand game, running your hands under the blankets with your cat when they were young, or maybe still do. Um, it could be pain or sensitivity to specific body parts. Uh, I had a cat when his back ate, he'd get a little nippy. It can be that your cat's not very social. You know, maybe you found your cat out in the streets and they're really just not used to people and they're just kind of know to live beside people. But most often, it's going to be something we call overstimulation. All cats deal with overstimulation to some degree. Um, not all cats escalate to aggression over, the, over that. Um, the nice thing is, there are signs to overstimulation. And that's typically the cat that you're petting and they're fine and they're rubbing and then suddenly they're biting. So if it's really bad, you might wanna get professional help. Um, and if you actually go to the IABC website, where you can get a cat trainer to come to your home. Most times you can just make a phone call to the shelter and we can assist with that as well. So overstimulation signs, your cat may be watching your hand very closely as you pet them. Their pupils may be dilated as, you know, in, in an otherwise well-lit room. They may have the hair on their back standing on end, their tail swishing, their back leg muscles just kind of twitching. It could be any or all of those. And some are a little more subtle. But typically, the clear thing to do with that is you see those signs, stop petting, create space, give your cat some room. Overstimulation is like an adrenaline rush. They have very limited control over how they respond to that. It's something that happens to them biologically, and they just react. So it's not your cat being mean or evil or anything like that. It's they're struggling and we want to help them out. And I talked a little bit about play therapy earlier and there's a link there on the bottom there that actually goes to a Jackson Galaxy demonstration of play therapy that's really, really educational. So hopefully that will help you guys out as well. Get a lot of these leash pulling. Now we talked about dominance. So we know it's not your dog isn't being dominant. Um, it can be that they have to go to the bathroom. It can be that this has worked for them. It can be that they've never been taught an alternative way. You know, if you open the door and let your dog go flying out the door, well, they're, it's what they know to do. And so we have to look at what do we do? Uh, again, I'm gonna look at management initially. You look at that dog in the picture and the harness on that dog clips on the back. That tends to create a sled dog effect. I prefer harnesses that slip that, that connect on the chest or underneath the chin. That helps them so that when they pull, they get turned about. They're not constantly pulling forward. Doesn't work for all dogs, but for many. Um, gentle leader is another option. We can also look at impulse control. We talked about nothing on life is free earlier. And really just getting with these dogs and teaching them that they can get what they want. They just have to trade for it. Or we can go into really just handling it and modifying it and doing leash training. I'm a big fan of the stop and go method. Stop and go method works really well. Um, and it's basically you're walking, your dog pulls, that leash gets tight, you stop. You're a wall, you give as little feedback as possible. Now, as soon as they give slack, whether it be they look back at you or they just relax a little, you move forward. And you can even pair that with a treat. Just make sure you're tossing that treat at your feet and not in front of them, otherwise you encourage them to pull again. Over time, they start to understand that they can have access to, to the leash to move around, but they're not necessarily pulling, and that's, that works better for them. You can also train them to what we call watch me, which is basically just reinforcing them for making eye contact. This starts in the home, 
And then once you're on walks, you just get their attention. You can call their name. And after a while, you'll find that they're naturally looking back at you and focusing more on you than on moving forward. So to reiterate, to recap, behaviors have functions. They happen for a reason. We want to find out what's going on. What is the reason for this behavior? What need or desire is this fulfilling? And let's find an alternative way to fulfill that need. You know, a good example is a dog that jumps on you. Dogs jumping on you, and whether you are pushing them off or kneeing them in the chest, you're giving them some form of attention, good or bad. And if that's what they're looking for, then they're getting what they want, and we're reinforcing that behavior. If we don't mind them jumping on us when we're in the garden, but when we wear our Sunday best, it's not okay, they don't know that distinction. It's a very high-end type of training that allows a dog to actually understand that kind of distinction, and not all dogs can even manage that. So your average dog doesn't understand the difference between I'm wearing a tux and I'm wearing overalls, and it's okay to do it now, and it's not okay to do it then. Um, so really figuring out what's going on, what is your dog trying to get, and how can I give them to fulfill that need is what we look for. So we talked a little bit about harnesses and cons and such. And, and you can get any of those at our Pasadena Shelter Shop. Um, you can actually call it in and just come by and pick it up. So very little contact involved. Um, and we're happy to help you with any of those things. So I, I encourage you guys to give us a call and, and look at uh, what tools you need to make your relationship more successful. And I've mentioned our behavior helpline and our um, Zoom a couple times here. We work with dogs, cats, and all kinds of critters. Um, we are happy to help you. That's what we're here to do. Um, our virtual behavior consults have been really great, and we we're actually able to, you know, see eye to eye and talk to people. And I think that it's it's been able, we've been able to help a lot of people during this very difficult time. And so we want to continue doing that and continue helping you guys. And I, I would further say, if you know, this was a very quick run through of behaviors and concerns. If we did not address your behavior, or if we did, but you've tried that and it didn't work, or it's not something that would work for your lifestyle, that's that particular solution. Give us a call. This was a quick and dirty rundown, but there are other options. And once we know your specifics and what's going on in your particular environment, we may be able to tailor advice just to your needs. So I'd like to leave you guys before we go to the Q&A uh, with this quote by Susan Friedman. Um, Dr. Susan Friedman is an incredible speaker on behavior and learning. And if any of you are interested in learning more about that, I encourage you to look her up. She actually started out working with children and now works with birds. And so um, she's an amazing teacher. Behavior doesn't just flow like a fountain. Behavior is a tool animals use to produce consequences. And I would further add even to fulfill needs and desires. And so rather than looking to correct the behavior, how do I stop them from doing this? Look at why they're doing it. And let's see if we can't give them an alternative way to fill that need. And with that, I will give it back to Sarah to uh, go into our Q&A. Yeah, thank you, Fernando. Um, so Fernando's gonna join us on his camera in just a second. Um, we did, I wanna uh, be completely transparent. And so for full disclosure, we, we had a ton of questions um, come through our email prior to this webinar. Um, and so we did our best to sort of um, create cohesive categories for those questions because a lot of them um, were fairly similar. Um, and uh, to Fernando's point about um, getting help uh, for very specific behaviors that you might be seeing in your pet, we do have a free behavior uh, helpline at 626-792-7151 extension 155. Um, and that phone number, as well as a link to registering for virtual consultations, is available at that URL that I put into the chat, pasadenahumane.org slash training. All right, so Fernando, we had some very common questions come through. Uh, the most common one we probably saw, uh, which you did uh, address um, in the presentation, um, was barking. And so one of the issues that we have with uh, owners who might have uh, more than one dog is they're out on a walk, 
uh, one of the dog begins uh, barking at another neighbor dog or, or a mailman or some someone else. And uh, the companion dog who's on the same walk uh, then starts getting engaged with the behavior as well. Do you have any recommendations for managing that type of situation? That's actually rather common. Um, and well, first I would say, let's separate the dogs, which may create a complication. It may mean you have to wake up a little bit earlier or stay out a little bit later when you're walking your dogs. Um, but we want to stop them from copying each other and rehearsing that behavior. Mirroring behavior from one animal to the other is a very common and natural behavior. And it's, it's a good sign in a well-socialized dog, but it can create problems in these situations. So we separate them and then focus on the dog that is starting the barking. At that point, I would work with redirection. And so when you're on your walk, keeping them focused on you, working on any behaviors they might know, um, to watch me is a great idea, asking for sits. The key is you wanna see those potential triggers, those other dogs before your dog does and get them focused on you. At that point, you're changing their emotional response to seeing that dog to I focus on mom instead of I need to go bark at that dog. Once you've gotten that dog under control, you can now work with the second dog and make sure that they're still solid. Then we can bring them back together. And hopefully at that point, you've gotten the behavior strong enough that you don't have to worry about one dog starting a, a situation that the other dog feeds off. Uh, Fernando, another question that we have is if the recommendation is to reward those wanted behaviors, the behaviors that we want to see with treats or attention or whatever that reward may be for that animal, um, what would the opposite be? So if we, beyond managing a behavior, if we see a behavior that we don't want, um, what would a sort of general opposite be to rewarding? So if I understand correctly, we're looking at rather than seeing a behavior we like and want to reward it, how do we handle behavior that we don't like? Um, and at that point, I, I would look at how do we get the dog to do a behavior that we do like? So redirecting, looking at the situation, um, very much like with the previous example of the dog walking. OK, how do I get my dog to not bark? I get them focused on me and I reward that behavior. Um, for a dog, for example, that maybe counter surfs, that's a difficult behavior to deal with. The first thing I would do is clear off the counter. That's a naturally reinforcing behavior. There are things up there to play with, there's food. If there's nothing up there, you're gonna decrease their excitement about going up there. And then you can reward them for not doing that behavior or for doing whatever alternative behavior they can do. Um, for things like jumping, we can look at what we call um, incompatible behaviors. And so I don't wanna punish my dog for jumping on me. I give him attention, it, it encourages the behavior. What can I do that he, that keeps them from jumping on me. Teach a really strong sit. And as soon as you see your dog look like he's about to jump, ask for that sit and then reward that heavily. You've now put your dog in a position where we call, you know, making him correct, giving him something that's positive, building his confidence, and have avoided the negative behavior. Um, another question that came through for us uh, is with Kat. Um, my cat gets on my pillow behind my head and pulls and bites on my hair. How could I stop this behavior? Interesting. Um, my cat used to do that. And I mentioned that play therapy a couple times. And what I would recommend is actually doing that play therapy before bed. And so that's taking a wand type toy. Um, some cats prefer, you know, hunting birds, some like mice. So, you know, they have the furry ones, they have the, the feathered ones. Um, the bird makes one that actually sounds like a wounded bird when it's flying through the air. Play with them. Mimic that animal. Let them get really worked up and exhausted. Give them that meat treat. Just a little bit. It doesn't have to be a lot. And now they've gone hunting. They've gotten their, their food. And what does a lion do after it's eaten and, and hunted and everything? Sleeps. Put your, put your lion to sleep. Great idea. <laughs> um, Another question that we had was um, a dog that is licking excessively, uh, whether that be on themselves, on the person's skin, clothing, furniture. Mm -hmm. um, typically, they're seeing it when the animal seems to be um, excited, um, but they're a little bit concerned about that it might be an excessive behavior. Okay. So I would confirm that it's not an allergy. Sometimes allergies can be exacerbated by the emotional state of the animal. So again, talk to your vet. Um, it could be stress. You know, there's, there's with humans, there's good stress and there's bad stress. 
it could be that your dog is in an excited state where it's getting to hang out with you and play with you. And now it's getting kind of worked up and doesn't know what, what to do with itself. So I would look at training at that point. You know, I often turn back to let's train the behavior away, you know, start working on sits and targets, which is them touching their, their nose to your hand. Um, maybe give them something, to, a toy to play with, redirecting that behavior to something else. I've often found that just a short training session at that specific moment helps to redirect them and then they settle. You can also teach that relaxation or protocol I mentioned. Another question we had is, uh, can verbal cues be confusing for pets? Ah, very good question. Um, so I'd start by saying our pets don't know English. You know, we can guess at what the meow or the bark is indicating, but we don't know it either. Um, they start to make connections with a particular behavior that occurs around a particular word. And there can be a lot of confusion. Um, I've heard of dogs that um, get what's called a poisoned cue. They start to see a, what a normal behavior like sit, becomes some, somehow it becomes a bad thing. Um, the nice thing is, it doesn't matter what you're saying, as long as you're pairing it consistently with the behavior. So um, I'm looking at my phone here and it's, you know, if I wanted phone to meet sit, all I have to do is pair the word phone every time he sat. And now they understand that that's what that means. That's how dogs learn different behaviors in different languages. Um, so it's really just about consistency and routine. Um, one question we had was in regards to uh, suggestions for calming a dog during fireworks. Uh, that touches near and dear to my heart because um, I just moved into the, my area and the last couple of nights there's been fireworks and my dogs have been quite anxious. Um, so there's a lot of different options um, ranging from talk to your vet and you might, depending on how bad it is, some sort of uh, medication can help with that. And I'll leave that to your vet to kind of figure out what's the best medication for that moment. That's not really my place. Um, but you can also look at uh, music. You know, last night my dog started yipping when the fireworks went off. So, and, and I crate them at night. So I went to their room and I sat down with them and I talked to them and I put on some music and they settled. And so, you know, I used that uh, Alexa, whatever thing, and just let it, let it play for a while. And, and they were quiet for the rest of the night. Um, it really varies on how bad the, the, the fireworks are or how bad the, the response to the fireworks are really. Um, but don't under underestimate the idea of medication. Um, and those high stressful moments, just for the short term, just to get them through that time period, it might be worthwhile. Uh, Fernando, we're having a lot of questions about um, uh, the phrase separation anxiety. Um, so some people are concerned that their uh, animal might have separation anxiety, but we do know there might be other forms of anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little bit about what those may look like? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so even the experts disagree on separation anxiety and, and what the definition is. Um, you know, I've had previous jobs where I've had long discussions where we, we disagreed. Um, both me and my peers and me and my management even. Um, I look at separation anxiety as a desire to get back to my owner. There's a connection there, there's a bond. I have a feeling of if I'm separated from them, I cannot live. It's that bad. Um, so with that, you have destruction to doorways, entry points, exits, windows, things like that. If your dog whines a little bit when you leave, chews on the couch, uh, rips up random papers, it's probably not separation anxiety. Separation anxiety is a very traumatic, high emotional state. Um, depending on the situation though, it can be just generalized anxiety. Maybe you just have an anxious dog. It could be transitional anxiety, which I see a lot in the shelter world. Um, and that's linked to change. So I go from one place to the next place to the next place. I don't know what's permanent anymore. Um, and I see this in a foster world as well, for the human foster world, where we go from home to home. This is just another stop on the way. This is, there's no permanence. And that's why dogs coming out of the shelter routinely take two to three months before they really settle into a new home. They need that time to realize this is a permanent change, not just another change amongst others. Um, thankfully though, the solution for most types of anxiety, um, except for maybe severe separation anxiety, are pretty similar. You want a routine. They want, your dog wants to know what comes A, B, C, what comes next. 
Um, get up at the same time, feed them, walk them, whatever it is your routine is, stick to it. Um, and, and, and training, um, giving them something to keep them busy when you leave. You know, my, I create my dogs, they go into the crate, they go in there and they get a calm. So there's no fight going into the crate because they love their calms. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's actually an excited moment. But I, I give that to them and then I leave. I don't make a big deal about it, I just leave. When I come home, I also don't rush to let them out or engage with them. I take my time, I put my things down, I may use the restroom. I come to them when I'm ready. So there's no excitement about my coming home either. So that kind of avoids that situation. Um, for dogs that tend to get very excited just seeing you grab your purse or your hat or whatever it may be, um, they're reading into your behaviors as far as leaving. I would do practice entries and exits. Pick up your purse, put it down. Put on your shoes, kick them off. Take away any connection to those behaviors so that they don't know what that means anymore. Uh, along the lines of sort of excitement or arousal, we've gotten some questions um, from dog owners who are having difficulty um, getting the harness and equipment on and off the dog uh, prior to and even after a walk. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, if it's a matter of your dog is not comfortable with the harness, getting it on them, I would definitely look at training them, you know, show them the harness, give them a treat, put it over their head, give them a treat. Um, if it's more of an excitement arousal issue, that nothing on life is free is going to help. It's going to help them to learn to self-control a little bit. And I say ritualize it. Um, I'm a highly ritualized person. My dogs know that I get a specific leash for each dog. They're color coded and they sit and I put the leash on the one dog. It's always the same dog first and then the other dog. Um, and it's not a matter of dominance. It's a matter of I want to make that consistent routine so they know what's coming next. When we get home, they sit. I check them over, make sure they don't have any thorns or anything like that. I take the leashes off them. And so it's this solid routine and, and it's a very low energy situation. There's no excitement. There's no, oh my God, that was such an awesome walk. It's calm. And that helps them to stay calm. And because it's ritualized, they get, they kind of stick with that. And then only after they've been released do they get a treat. And so it's not a matter of, I'm excited to get my treat so my mouth is everywhere. They know that there's steps that are going to occur before that and they have to occur before that. But that's, again, that consistency. If you do that once in a while, you're not going to get the behavior you're looking for. Uh, another question that we're getting is why some of our pets uh, might appear a little more reactive to um, some dogs or other animals and not others, especially during walks. OK. Um, that goes back to experience for the most part. Uh, it could be that they had really good experiences with a particular type of dog, um, and so they, they get excited. And so they, that's what we call the barrier frustration. They're trying to get to the other dog. It could be they've had very bad experiences with that type of dog, and so they're, they're getting on the defensive early. Um, it, if, it, if you're looking at size, that can make a difference. So if you've got, um, I don't know, a German Shepherd who only gets excited when he sees Chihuahua-sized dogs, that's another issue there. That could be predation. It could be that he just really likes little dogs to play with. Um, it all depends on what that history is. Um, and so I, what I would look at is how are they without that leash when they're just relaxed? Can they engage with other dogs if you had that experience? If you hadn't done that and you're concerned, I would definitely look at hiring a professional to assist with that just because it's very easy to take a dog that's excited and tip them over into aggression if there's not handled correctly. Um, we also got a surprising number of questions regarding um, dogs that are eating their own poop. Um, and the, uh, some of the questions uh, were fairly general, um, but there were some questions about uh, dogs doing it inside the crate. Um, mm -hmm. So is there any relationship between um, crates and an animal being more likely to um, defecate and eat? and eat their poop inside that crate? Absolutely. Um, there are a couple of different issues that come, up, come to my mind there. Um, this crate training, you know, was your dog properly crate trained to begin with? Um, and, uh, and a lot of us tend to think of, you know, our dogs, you know, wolves live in these little tunnels and whatnot, so our dogs automatically want to go to a crate. Not necessarily. You know, they have to get a, a, accustomed to it. Um, my girl came to me crate trained. And I was able to speak to her previous owner and confirm that it was done, but she needed to be re-crate trained when she came to me, it was a new environment. And so I had to slowly get adapted to it. Um, and, and I just did training sessions next to the crate, clicker training, 
She did a behavior. I press the clicker. I give her a treat, but I toss the treat in the crate. So now she's going in the crate, coming out of the crate, going in the crate, with all the time grabbing these wonderful treats. And all those wonderful feelings that come around from clicker training, those positive associations, were put onto the crate. Um, so I look at the, the, the training process first. I'd also look at the size of the crate. Your dog should be able to walk in, turn around, and lay down, and that's about it. You know, they've got enough room that they can create a separate compartment to go to the bathroom. The crate's too big. Um, now, if you already have this crate, crates can be expensive. You know, they do sell dividers that you can kind of shorten your crate down some. Um, but I highly recommend just looking at that crate and looking at the size and being very careful about that because too big a crate causes more of a problem. Lastly, I'd also look at how long is your dog in a crate. If your dog's a puppy, you're looking at however many number of months plus one. So a four month old dog, if trained, can probably last about five hours max, maybe less, depending on the breed um, and experience. Um, an adult can probably do between eight and 10 hours, maybe 12, depending on the individual and the age and whatnot. Um, but you go anything above that and you're really pushing their limitations. I mean, imagine not going to the bathroom for 12 hours. Right. Um, another question we had is, um, somebody was being woken up by their cat, um, in the middle of the night or very early, uh, assumed that due to the meowing that the cat, uh, wanted to eat. Um, so complied and provided, um, some food and some treats. Um, and now they seem to work themselves into a 3 a.m. feeding <laughs> schedule, which uh, I will relate to. I did the exact same thing with my uh, little dog, Tula. Um, can we talk about how we might undo some of those reinforced habits? Yes. Oh, wow. A um, couple things come to mind. If you're able to, I highly recommend switching to a, a free feeding uh, um, method for cats using feeder toys. I don't recommend this for dogs typically, but for cats giving them feeder toys that they can engage with, that removes you from the equation. All you're doing is refilling the toys and then they can feed whenever they want to. For some, that's not an option or maybe that's just a philosophical choice you're not comfortable with, that's okay. Um, first and foremost, and this is the hard part, we gotta ignore them. I remember when I first moved into my last house, my cat would meow at two in the morning and I would, first instinct was to get up or even yell at her, you know, shut up. And I just sit there and I close my eyes and keep quiet. Because as soon as you give them attention, even if it's bad attention, you're reinforcing it. Um, the other thing is keeping them, give them something to do before bedtime. So let's go back to that play therapy. Let's give them that option to really wear them out, give them that treat so they, they're sedated and let them sleep. And so don't reinforce the behavior as hard as that can be, ignore it. Give them an alternative and give them some exercise beforehand. And before we wrap up, um, Fernando, um, I do want to again acknowledge how many amazing questions we got. So we clearly um, have people who are really concerned about maintaining that positive human animal bond with their pet um, and want to do all they can uh, to manage those behaviors and ensure an excellent quality of life. Um, so we want to tell people that if they need to reach out to our behavior department about any specific behaviors their pet is exhibiting, or they need more information, or they'd like a virtual consult, all that information is available at PasadenaHumane.org slash training. Um, but Fernando, are there any behaviors um, that you feel are better addressed one-on-one -on -one? um that people might be asking about um that you would prefer that they call in or email about you know anything that has to do with any kind of physical safety i typically would recommend that you know if you've got dogs that are fighting for example especially larger dogs uh, where there's a higher potential for harm um I, I definitely think that's something that needs to be handled carefully um you know not all trainers will even work with that kind of behavior depending on the situation uh, we've got some good experienced trainers here who can help with a lot of different situations um and, and while I'm touching on the whole dog aggression issue, I do want to emphasize you should never, ever, ever get involved in a dog fight. I know it's that instinct to protect your dog and separate them. But in that situation, even your dog or the dog that you know best may turn around and redirect on you. They're worked up. I and mean, imagine walking through a dark alley and someone touches you on the shoulder. They might be asking for directions, but you're probably not going to respond really well. So definitely want to keep separate from that situation. Um, cat bites, if it's if they're really going after you, I mean, if it's well, I talked about earlier that play, the uh, overstimulation, that's one thing. I have heard of cats that'll chase people out of rooms and really get worked up. 
at that point, you really want to look at getting some professional help. And you know, we're here to help with that. And depending on the situation, we can definitely offer some advice. All right. We really appreciate it, Fernando. Um, everyone, thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. We hope it got the conversation going. Um, we hope that you reach out to us should you need any help. Pasadena Humane is always here. You can check out our website with all of our programs and services at pasadenahumane.org. And we hope to see you next time. Thank you, Fernando. My pleasure, thank you. Thank you.